Good afternoon. My name is Jess Keating Floyd, and I direct the Notre Dame Office of Life and Human Dignity in the McGrath Institute for Church Life. Last week, or excuse me, the week before, late the week before, the Supreme Court handed down a momentous decision in the Dobbs case, which effectively sent the question of abortion legislation back to the states to regulate. Obviously, this does not mean abortion is now illegal. It means that states are now responsible and able to adjudicate the question of abortion um, at the state level. So we will have some states where abortion will be virtually outlawed, other states uh, that are poised to become abortion sanctuaries where abortion access will be extended and expanded. But it's a whole new reality for us in the United States. In the days after the court's ruling, there was, of course, a deluge of news coverage. You can find commentary from many of our panelists in the New York Times and Religious News Service, in the Church Life Journal and Christianity Today. I was particularly struck by a line from Karen Swallow Pryor's piece in the New York Times. She wrote, quote, I lament the impoverishment of social imagination that cannot conceive of a world in which women can flourish without abortion. So we're here today to discuss what a world where women can flourish without abortion might look like, to discuss the ruling and its aftermath and what's next for building a sustainable and lasting culture of life. So Ms. Bakiati, I'd like to start with you. About a week and a half ago, the Supreme Court handed down their monumental decision in the Dobbs case, which effectively overturned Roe and sent the question of abortion back to the states. Can you explain to us what this decision means and particularly for women's flourishing in society? Sure, so I am deeply gratified that the court has reversed Roe and Casey, but boy, do we have much work to do as I'm sure all of us will be talking about today. So I wanna just say a couple of words about the opinion, especially the part that I was really pleased about. And that is really the emphasis on the history of abortion law before Roe and especially around the ratification of the 14th Amendment. As many scholars have shown and the Alito opinion really maintains uh, in many pages, it was really an incoherent claim that an abortion right could be part of 14th Amendment liberty when all the states at the time of that amendment's ratification and really up until Roe had statutes that prohibited abortion throughout pregnancy. And as I've written extensively, laws protective of unborn children, those laws that were struck down in Roe were very much supported by 19th century women's rights advocates who saw, first of all, abortion as the act of violence it is. And second, understood that maternal responsibilities to care and nurture one's child really begin when the child is still developing in their mother's womb. So these women really worked for their rights to property contract and all that in order that they may fulfill those responsibilities. So um, they worked really you know, to improve women's lives so that they wouldn't be in this position to feel as though they needed to seek out an abortion. And I think the contrast with what we've seen over the last you know, 30 at least, but then even 50 years um, about sort of the rhetoric of equality is an important one that for them, um, the need that women felt to access abortion was not evidence of women's equality as our society has thought about it, but really rather evidence that women had not yet been recognized as full equals in a society that was fundamentally designed for men, for sort of male, male bodies and, um, and sort of the, the, you know, quote, autonomous unencumbered male. And one wonders if any men are like that, but anyway. So now, I mean, the existence of basically having lived for you know, 50 years in a society that basically gave up on this early feminist vision, really a society that since Roe has used abortion as a privileged response to paternal abandonment, female poverty, substandard healthcare, and a really abysmal workplace conditions um, is really, we've now got a lot of work to do, kind of the work that the first wave was, um, was pushing forward. They achieved so much but there's so much more work that we need to be doing that many have been doing at the grassroots, have been fighting for in different states and certainly at the federal level, but that we have this new charge, I think, um, to really create this life affirming, uh, woman affirming society. And, um, and I think now that you know, states can um, really you know, restore these protections for unborn life, that we're in a position to really move toward, um, more, move toward that vision, uh, that original feminist vision. 
Thanks, Erica. You mentioned sort of this charge that we have now to fully embrace and build a, a society that values both uh, prenatal life and also women's equality and, uh, and um, flourishing. What do you see as sort of key opportunities and challenges as we move forward? So I, I mean, I think there's so many, um, but as a, as a legal theorist, kind of political theorist, I think it's helpful um, to really try to reframe the abortion debate and just how we speak about um, kind of the nature of what we're debating. Because we've really traded for the last um, several decades in, in a real talk of kind of absolute rights on either side, but especially to autonomy and to this idea that we're these, I mean, you look at the dissent and it's just all in this kind of framework that we're these autonomous beings and that's most fundamentally who we are. And really kind of trade that in for one that acknowledges just the most fundamental basic reality that we're deeply interdependent. And so instead of talking about kind of rights either to, you know, that the mother has or really that the child has, instead talk about really the fundamental duties we owe to one another. So, you know, what do the mother and father owe the child? What do the mother and father owe each other? What do we as a society owe to mothers and fathers? And I really think when we start to talk in this way and really um, think in this way that we can begin to see, I think some realignment and um, putting forth some, some policies, but also just a fundamental like cultural change in thinking about this issue altogether. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Buchowski, I wanna turn to you. Um, the Dobbs decision has opened up a really important and I would argue long overdue conversation about maternal health um, and how we can provide the best care for mothers and their children. I think of your practice could be a really good model for what does pro-life health care look like moving forward. Um, and, and frankly, there are other, other practices in Catholic hospitals and Catholic OBGYN practices that can help model for us what this might look like for all uh, all care for women. So first I wanna ask you, can you tell us a little bit more about your practice? What does it look like to practice pro-life medicine in caring for mothers and babies? Uh, sh sure, Jess. Um, it's just good to be with you. And I just wanted to thank McGrath for uh, this opportunity. Uh, it's a much needed service to the community, but to many of us, including myself, um, abortion happens to real people. And it's a medical procedure that ends the life and can possibly hurt the life of women and, and, and many people as the ripple effects move out from the womb to the person, to the community, to the family. And uh, I performed abortions early in my training and it truly hardened my heart because in the reality of the difficulty of performing these procedures, starting with the most early, and progressing, I realized that I was really taking care of two patients, two distinct intertwined human beings that have a physiology and a biochemistry that is incredibly intertwined. And if we really wanted human flourishing, elective abortions uh, were not the answer. And so we've been here in the National Capital Area for 28 years, we've provided life-affirming medical care, caring for two patients. And we never try to do harm to the human person, to the human being. We always try to treat two patients and we never pit one against the other. It's not physically good and it's not psychologically good. Um, and as we know, and as what uh, I believe Erica talked about, so many of my patients that I've listened to to develop this approach talk about the coercion that they, the reasons why they choose abortion, it's really coercive. And so uh, once you realize that, then I realized I had to serve women in a Hippocratic way, in a way that's been being done before row, through row, and after row. And yet the challenges for these last 50 years, we've assumed that elective abortion, the direct intention of killing a child is good. If 90% of abortions are for non-medical reasons, what are we doing? And so as a doctor, um, my own change of heart was, one is we have to provide care to all women. So we almost have an almshouse approach. Divine Mercy Care helps us care for the underserved. We provide alternatives to the chemical pollutions of a woman's body. 
we utilize the time of a sick child in the womb of their mother with very little time after we sever the cord as a hospice. So we have the Kristen Anderson Perinatal Hospice Program. We participate in the abortion pill reversal project because many women change their minds in the middle of this most life-changing decision of elective abortion. And we also treat all the regular gynecological problems like polycystic ovary disease, endometriosis, by going after the disease. Um, what makes us unique is that we partner with pregnancy centers. Send them to us. I've talked to my abortion friends. Send them to us if they're in trouble, if they don't understand, if they don't want to go through with it. Send them to us. And it's been that dynamic that I think has kept us viable and sane in this crazy world. And uh, we have a real model here. As Jerome Lejeune taught, uh, taught me, he's the father, the genetic founder of the extra chromosome of Down syndrome. We must always hate the disease yet love the patient. This is the practice of medicine. While realizing that we shouldn't fear medicine, but the folly of mankind thinking elective abortion is healthy for children, born and unborn, women, mothers, families, and communities. And so this model that we've had for 28 years is uh, working and we have doctors and midwives and staff and technicians. And since we know so many of the groups across the country who are also providing this, it's been a great community to thrive mm. and to promote uh, the flourishing of the human person. Thank you so much. I want to follow up on sort of two points. You mentioned uh, coercion, and I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about what you see in terms of women experiencing coercion. Charlie, I know this is something you've also written on, so uh, feel free to chime in as well. But, but from your firsthand experience, what does that look like? Charlie has been a blessing uh, in that area. And I just want you to know that, remember, abortion happens to persons to real live blood and flesh, body and soul and spirit people. The number, one, the number one reason that I hear every time I ask is I have no choice, doctor. I don't have the finances. I don't have the support system. My parents threw me out. If I go back to my country, they're gonna take off my head. Uh, I've heard this is, no one comes in and says, yeah, I, I, want, I want an elective abortion, never. This empowers me, never. Now I've done them both ways for all sorts of reasons. And the health and the humanity of offering people a real medical option and walking alongside all the people in, on, your, on our, on our webcast right now and all the services that a community has, we can improve health because elective abortions kill one and damage the other, and they don't have any place in Hippocratic medicine. And so we provide real options for that. And it's that coercion that we're just providing one real medicine, but then connecting them with real women who've walked through that problem that they're facing. And it's that experiential example, oh, you see their shoulders the hugs, the tears, the smiles. That's the human reality that we see every day at Tepiac. Charlie, I don't know if you wanna jump in on this question of coercion since I know you've written on it a bit. Sure, um, lots of people have on the ground experience on this call that I have some of, but not as much obviously. Uh, but. Um, the studies all seem to indicate that, especially for women that have uh, more than one abortion, intimate partner violence uh, correlates very strongly um, with that group. And um, that's, that tracks with the fact that the most, uh, the demographic groups uh, that are most likely to oppose uh, abortion are also the ones, unfortunately, who are most likely to have abortion, at least in terms of raw numbers, if not percentage. So there's, diabolically, there's this very, very large group of people who are morally opposed to abortion, having abortion is that they know are killings of their own children. <clears throat> and um, uh, there's lots of reasons for that. And John talked about some of them, but I think we really need to focus on intimate partner violence as being a major factor here too. Thanks, Charlie. Um, Dr. Bruchowski, I wanna come back to you because in the last week there have been 
a number of concerns raised about adequate care for women um, experiencing any number of complications. So ectopic pregnancy, septic uterus, miscarriage, and concerns that women will not be able to receive this kind of um, needed medical care. Can you help situate that um, for us and explain what these laws mean for the practice of medicine? Um, first, I just want to say that, means. Yeah. sure, um, I had a brief uh, relationship with uh, Bernard Nathanson when he talked about aborting America, and he talked about how you conflate and confuse and create chaos and then establish the language that's used. And I'm seeing the same thing now, and I think it's pure fear mongering. Um, to think that elective abortion, which is the direct destruction, elimination of a unborn child is healthcare or a treatment for disease um, just doesn't, doesn't compute with our reality. Uh, prior to Roe, um, all OBGYNs, and for many of us since Roe, we've been treating ectopics and miscarriages and severe maternal indications like seizures and high blood pressure, preeclampsia, renal disease, diabetes. And we've been doing it excellently and medically and ethically through sound Hippocratic medicine by caring for the two patients. Um, the key is, is that 73 to 95% of doctors do not perform abortions. They don't do it. They may refer, but they choose not to do it. And there's probably many reasons for that, that at some point we can get into it. But today, because we have better science, better research, better discussion about disease, and we have better algorithms, better antibiotics, better drugs, better monitoring, medicine has changed in 50 years. And it's changed for the better in most cases. And so as we begin to apply this, um, this is what happens. Now for pre-viability, there are cases where women, the, the uterus, the bag of fluid ruptures the membranes and a process begins of infection of the placental membranes inside the womb, inside the uterus, around the unborn child, around the fetus. And because that's a life-threatening condition, we treat the disease by emptying the uterus, by giving the woman medicines. The untoward secondary effect is the death of the child. Our intention as real life-affirming physicians is to always treat the disease to the best of our ability and to get both patients as far along as we can. Well, miscarriages, the baby is dead in the vast, vast majority of cases. In ectopic pregnancies, the same is also true. When there is a heartbeat, there are ways, once again, we deliver if, the, if it's an inevitable miscarriage and the cervix is dilating and there's heavy bleeding, we deliver the pregnancy because the uterus, that's our intent. We've got to fix the abscess forming, the infection that's festering that can cause the death of the life of the mother. In ectopics, there are ways of removing the diseased portion of tube that caused the problem in the first place. So what they're doing is they're trying to say, oh, we need the elective abortion for real medical maternal diseases. And that is just not true. That is truly not true. And this panel, which is much smarter than I am academically, they understand those realities, both philosophically, theologically, feminine, the genius of the woman, I think women are resilient in their true genius. I think they're incredibly resilient. And I think physicians, whether male or female, really care. It's why we got into OBGYN. It's incredibly joyful and challenging to care for two patients. And so what I'm seeing is pure unadulterated fear mongering and trying to conflate ideas and realities. Thank you so much. I think that was really helpful in understanding the distinction between what is you know, called a therapeutic abortion, a true therapeutic abortion, and what is an elective abortion. 
Um, I have more questions uh, for you, Dr. Bruchowski, and for, uh, for uh, Erica, but I'm going to move on to our next two panelists, um, uh, Destiny and uh, Sister Virginia Joy. You are both working you know, on the front lines with women considering abortion um, on what we could call the demand side of the issue. Can you speak from each of your particular context and vantage points about both what it means to accompany um, women who find themselves unexpectedly pregnant and what you see as some of the greatest needs um, that we can make real social change around for women um, and children. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely say that we kind of have this four-pronged uh, effort to remove any barriers. When a woman comes to us and says, you know, I'm considering making an abortion decision, oftentimes it's because of housing, transportation, childcare, or healthcare if she's in a rural area. And so housing is usually the number one. Either she's being, you know, kicked out of her home, you're not going to stay here if you remain pregnant, um, or she's now struggling to, to pay rent, to keep her life together. And so if I can't even support myself, how on earth am I going to bring a new life into this world? Housing is a huge one. And it's something where, yes, there are you know, maternity homes, I think the pro-life movement has put a lot of effort into trying to meet that need, but it's so vast. And so when we look into community housing, things like that, I mean, a woman who just found out she's pregnant, maybe she's two, three months along, she goes to a housing authority and they're telling her there's an 18 month to five year wait list for her to get any type of housing. So these are definitely things that are going to be weighing on this woman. And um, as somebody who is kind of tired of waiting for the government to do things right, um, I think that that's where I look to communities, you know, how can we actually help women and this isn't a matter of, you know, oh, we'll take, take your child, you know, this isn't baby mills we're creating family preservation is incredibly important. So how do you take in the woman and the child, how do you care for them and there is going to be trauma, but there's also this lacking support system. Um, I got pregnant at 16 years old. And the only reason that abortion was never an option for me is because I had a roof over my head. I had a family. I had people willing to walk with me through this. And, you know, laws, laws are one thing, but they can't reach out and actually touch somebody and say, how, how can I help you? What do you need right now? How do we remove the crisis from this crisis pregnancy? And I think that's where we need these boots on the ground pro-lifers to, and, and honestly, everybody at this point, it goes so far beyond um, the ballot box. It goes so far beyond, um, okay, row's over. Now we can pack up and go home. Like, no, the, I, bad news, you guys, that was actually the easiest part of this work. Like that was the bottom rung. So now the work that honestly should, we should have been working on in full force for the last 49 years, uh, now it really has to step up. It's gone from being optional to an absolute necessity. And so I would just highly encourage people who this has been a political issue for them or a philosophical issue, like, no, time to, time to get your hands dirty. Like it's time to step in and actually start providing these resources. Um, the advice that we've been giving people, where is the excess in your life? Look at your own life. You know, here in the States, we all have some level of excess. So whether that's making donations to people who are doing the work or it's, I have extra room in my home. I was gonna sell this car, but now, you know, maybe I could give it to a pregnant mom so that she's actually able to access uh, quality care, again, especially in rural areas, we found that that's a real struggle. Uh, so she can make it to doctor's appointments so we can have better birth outcomes. Because every time we have a woman who has an unfortunate birth outcome or struggles with her health during pregnancy, you know, here in America, we're not doing great when it comes to the infant and maternal mortality rate among women of color, especially. So the more quality care they can get, the fewer headlines that we are going to have that are saying, this is, this is all because of bro. It's because the system wasn't ready. Pro-lifers didn't step up. You only care about, you know, the unborn. It's time for people to, to move to action. Pro-life, you know, I've said before, it is absolutely a, it's a verb. It has to be an action. How can we, you know, set politics aside for a second and just focus on loving the woman right in front of us? Yeah, I would say, yeah, just to echo what Destiny's already said, um, the women who come to us, we find, you know, who are who are thinking about having an abortion or sort of pursuing an abortion, we would say, you know, we find that it's always driven by fear. Um, 
fear of whether it's the unknown, whether it's fear of all the things Destiny said, fear of you know not having the financial resources, not having the housing, not having the support of those who should be supporting them, whether it's the father of the baby, their own family. So this decision we have just found year after year is this um, is driven by 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 fear and. Um, our role then, um, as you know, we've all made decisions in fear. And when you make a decision in fear, you're not really free. And so our role in working with these women, which is such a, such a privilege, um, is to kind of say, well, if we could remove the fears, you know, and if, if housing weren't an issue, if um, education weren't an issue, you know, finding a job or, or all the many kind of things pressing on her, what would she most desire to choose? And and, and every woman that we've served, you know, again, what she most longs for is this most natural bond between herself and the child. And uh, so again, we, we get to kind of be in that privileged place of then working with her. And it's not, uh, and I know Destiny is this too, it's not like just while they're pregnant or uh, once they've had the baby. I mean, it's, um, we're in their lives for as long as they need us to be in their lives. I mean, I can tell you, I was in the crisis mission um, seven years ago. I'm still in touch with women. I've helped one woman move more than four times. I've helped her get a car more than five times. Destiny's laughing, she knows. Um, but that's this like this solidarity, this non-abandonment policy of we're in their lives for as long as they need us. We have women who lived with us and, and delivered their children, their, their children while they were kind of living with us. And their kids are now in college and we're helping them move. We're helping them get into college. We're helping with whatever they need. Uh, there really has to be that practical um, support, emotional, spiritual, physical. We're connecting them with high risk, <laughs> high risk doctors who can help them. Um, it's, it's everything um, that we really have to sort of build this community, this culture around her that will uphold her in such a way that um, she feels her own dignity first and recognizes the value of her life. That, that is the stunning like sort of transformation we've seen because we, we really, we, we delight in the women who come to us. We use that word, but like essentially we try to act as a mirror reflecting back to her like the goodness that we see in her, the beauty, the strength, the courage. Um, and we just, we just try to reflect that back to her. And, and, um, and again, we, we see her maybe come to realize things about herself she never knew were possible. And, and when she can realize, um, you know, a woman who knows she's loved can do anything. So when she realizes that, um, the life she's carrying turns into this like, Un, unrecognizable gift, you know, this unimaginable gift that is um, entrusted to her to draw her to become even more and more who she was destined to be. So. Beautiful. I want to come back to you both in a moment to talk about some of these very concrete, practical ways that folks who want to get involved can get involved. You've already sort of alluded to some and and Destiny, I wanna hear a little bit more about the work you do. I see you all and the sisters as well, blurring political boundaries, these sort of hard, hard set places where we've encamped ourselves. I see that in your work with uh, migrant mothers, especially, but for the moment, I'm gonna move on to Charlie and to Dan. Um, you both speak and write frequently on sort of the social and political dimensions of abortion. Charlie, you've recently been talking about what pro-life 3.0 might look like. Um, I'm wondering if between you and Dan, we can hear more about what 1.0 and 2.0 were and what 3.0 might look like. This is a team question. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll go first, but I really owe, um, I owe my thinking about this to Dan's amazing book, Defenders of the Unborn here. I knew there was a difference between a sort of older pro-life movement and, a, and, a, and a, the one I was in, but I didn't really understand how different it was until reading his book. I mean, and it's, it, it really is a 1.0 versus 2.0 distinction in my mind. In fact, in the 1.0 version before Roe and leading up to Reagan, 
there really wasn't a sense that the pro-life movement was, you know, Republican or conservative at all. In fact, these things didn't break down on, under typical um, political lines. Governor Reagan of California, Republican, um, so signed, uh, uh, you know, abortion into law in California. The go Republican governor of New York, Rockefeller, led the pro-choice charge for much of his his life. So. Um, and then on the other side, there were people who were protesting the Vietnam War one day and going to anti-abortion pro-life uh, rallies the next and, you know, discarding both their birth certificates and birth certificates and draft cards as kind of tools of government oppression um, related to life. Um, but even after Roe, I think it's fair to say that it took pro-lifers even beyond that years to really kind of get in with the you know the three-legged stool of conservatism somehow we ended up uh com you know combining with aggressive war hawks and small government libertarians and that, those were strange bedfellows to say the least but by the 2010 midterms after pro-life democrats got slaughtered after voting for obamacare we talk about why that happened if you'd like and especially after the 2016 um uh, democratic uh, platform basically said abortion is great uh, no limits, positive good, basically we need it for human flourishing. I think that's when 2.0 was basically solidified and where was, you have the kind of just things we imagine today is just kind of par for course. But now I think, I think it's fair to say we're in a very different moment. The goal of pro-life 2.0 has been achieved. I think the main goal, Roe and Casey being gone. Um, and also that three-legged stool has collapsed. There is no fu uh, conservative fusion, fusionism anymore. Um, and uh, pro-life 3.0 has begun. Now, what it's going to become will take a long time to figure out. But one of the reasons I was so excited to accept this invitation from you is that a lot of people on this panel are going to be uh, major players in shaping what 3.0 becomes. And Dan Williams is certainly one of those people. Thank you, Charlie. I'm really honored to hear uh, how influential my book was on your, your thinking, and uh, I'm glad to have contributed uh, in any way that I could. It was certainly eye-opening for me to do the research for that book and to, to arrive at a deeper understanding of some things that maybe I'd sort of suspected, but uh, certainly had not fully realized until uh, diving into some of the historical research. Um, but I, I think Charlie is, is right uh, that the pro-life movement has experienced several different phases, and this is a critical transition point. Um, I think the, the frustrating thing uh, for people who would like to see a recovery of some of that uh, pro-life 1.0 is that no state policy uh, this year or next year, if trends continue the way that they're, they're, they're moving, uh, is likely to really match very well with that uh, comprehensive pro-life philosophy. So what has happened uh, in, the, uh, in the last 45 years or so is that a, a pro-life movement that was grounded in a comprehensive life ethic that, that drew very heavily from mid 20th century uh, Catholic social teaching uh, and that had some appeal to, um, to a few mainline Protestants, some Jews who also had uh, this, this comprehensive life ethic, uh, transitioned to being a movement that was uh, tied very closely to uh, Southern conservative politics. And Roe versus Wade, I think, contributed to that in the sense that uh, making uh, the cause about overturning a, a decision of a liberal court appealed to a lot of conservatives. Um, but after 45 years of this, uh, there's no longer a state that would be open to both uh, an expanded social safety net um, protections for uh, women who are facing crisis pregnancies, uh, extended family leave, which I know is something that Charlie's written about very recently, uh, and they would also be open to restrictive abortion policy. So I think as a result, pro-lifers are going to have to both capitalize on the, uh, the shared goals uh, in whatever state they happen to live in, but also challenge those areas of of the predominant political thinking in that state that might not be in accordance with those goals. So that's both a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, so for people on this call who are in New York, for example, uh, there is no chance, as you well know, that New York is going to uh, 
take any steps to try to make abortion more difficult to access or to expand legal protection for the unborn. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, New York is going to expand abortion availability in order to serve women from, from other states so that if Pennsylvania ends up moving in a more restrictive direction on abortion, uh, New York will expand their abortion services to encourage uh, women across state lines uh, in order to, uh, to access uh, abortion. But uh, on the other hand, uh, there probably will be some opportunities, we hope, to, uh, to expand a social safety net that may actually reduce the abortion rate. Um, similarly, in the conservative South, while states are working very hard to try to, to restrict abortion uh, and maybe to, to ban it almost entirely, uh, some states already have, some states are waiting on court decisions to do that, but within the next few weeks or months, probably most of uh, the conservative South is going to have a very restrictive abortion policy. On the other hand, uh, some of those states could reduce abortion rates considerably, I would argue, by expanding social services. So uh, Mississippi and, and Texas, um, among others, uh, have not uh, signed on to Medicaid expansions. Uh, if they agree to Medicaid expansions, then arguably a number of women who are facing the sort of dilemmas uh, that Dr. Bruchowski described uh, could potentially feel more empowered to make a life-affirming decision. Uh, Louisiana, which uh, is just waiting on a court decision by the end of this week to, to implement a, a near total ban on abortion, has the worst uh, maternal mortality rate in the whole United States. So I would say that, that pro-lifers in Louisiana could transition from trying to make re uh, restrictive abortion policies a priority because those are already going to be a reality in that state and start to ask the question, is there anything that they can do to, uh, to create policies that will, will help uh, reduce that uh, maternal uh, mortality rate? And, and so that's a sort of uh, question that I think uh, pro-lifers are going to have to ask uh, in this pro-life 3.0 stage. What, what would it mean to be pro-life in my particular state? Uh, and that may vary now uh, in ways that were not necessarily true uh, a year ago. Thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists for um, for joining us. We're going to go to the open Q and A portion from our audience. Um, one question that sort of piggybacks off of of what uh, Dan and Charlie have just been talking about uh, is to um, sort of everyone on the panel, but specifically addresses what Sister Virginia Joy and Destiny were talking about, sort of naming exactly what we need. So this uh, question asked, the CDC reported um, over 600,000 abortions in 2019, and that number's probably low because not all states report. Um, and we don't have 600,000 Destinies or Sister Virginia and Joy's to provide a social service. So what do we, how do we, um, effectively advocate for government policy for things like um, government funded housing, et cetera. Um, how do we get bishops and other Catholics um, to be part of that movement? And how do we also, I think, um, continue to build community networks um, that support women and children on the ground? So that's sort of a multi-layered question can be engaged by anyone on the panel. I would Can say I, this is, oh, you want to do it? No, and, Destiny, I want, I want you to talk about all of this. I just want to frame, just make one little framing shift because I think it's actually false to think that we're going to have the same number of abortions after restrictions as we have, as we've had um, with kind of, you know, wide scale abortion access, because there is a way that limiting abortion or restricting abortion is going to change people's sexual behaviors just because they're going to either they're going to take the sexual act more seriously and what potentially could the consequences of that act so whether that's abstaining from sexual intercourse or whether that's using two forms of birth control or whatever it is they choose to do i think that we are not going to see as many mm -hmm. um as many uh, women sort of uh, as many sort of women wanting abortions or as as many sort of babies as you know we would have had as abortions just a thank you and I think something we have to realize is whether the states have restrictive laws or open access there are still going to be women facing unplanned pregnancies in these states and what I'm seeing 
um, kind of we have a younger following on New Wave Feminist, right, is, and also being more kind of um, in the generation of social media, I'm already seeing videos of how to order abortion pills from other states. And this is how you get around this. And this is how you do this. And um, so I do think it's very important, uh, obviously, that we we do meet the needs. We understand what it is, as Sister Virginia said, you know, the fear that women are feeling to begin with, because, you know, there's the the quote that I love from Frederica Matthews Green, where she says, no woman wants an abortion like she wants an ice cream cone or a Porsche. She wants it as an animal with its leg caught in a trap, wants to not itself free. And so we have a lot of pro-choice people right now who are absolutely terrified and they're coming alongside these women and saying, let us help you gnaw yourself free. That's what we're trying to do. You're going to be leaving this trap maimed and bloody, but they think that they're helping. They think that that's the compassionate answer. And as pro-life feminists, what we're saying is let us look at the trap. Let us remove the trap completely. And this trap is a more uh, you know, patriarchal world that was built for men by men that was never meant to accommodate female fertility. And so when we look at corporations, institutions, schools, right, um, there are ways for them to say, we, we are going to offer paid family leave. We are going to make sure that you have the, everything you need. You have the accommodations and the protections you need in the workforce or in academia. Um, and then my, my biggest fear, I'm going to be honest, is I am in Texas. And so states like Texas, once we make these restrictive laws, um, the politicians kind of got what they wanted. They can say, we did this pro-life thing. And so keep voting for us. I don't know that they have the same incentive to actually step up a lot of these policies. And I do think that that is where pro-life 3.0, you know, this third wave of kind of what the pro-life movement is, we have to get incredibly creative. I think it is going to be a lot of charities. It is going to be um, a lot of, you know, maybe just even communities coming together. I run a secular organization, so it doesn't necessarily have to be the church. And I know you said that there's not 6,000 uh, Sister Virginias or, or me. Here's the thing. There, there is. Like, it, mm. New Wave Feminist started as a MySpace page. It was, we had like four followers. And you can grow something when you put... Uh, when you find the common ground with people on the pro-choice side, and I would say especially the reproductive justice organizations, a lot of them have the same, um, they're not super pro-abortion. They realize for a lot of women, it's not a choice, it's coercion. And when you come to them and say, I'm noticing this problem in my community, the infant and maternal mortality rate, especially among women of color in Texas, Louisiana, and the South, right? This is something that we all care about. So how do how can we work together to remove this trap? Because not not just one side is going to be able to remove the trap. We all have to remove it. And if you can pressure, you know, your elected officials on this side and people on this side can pressure their elected officials, and then I'm an independent, so I'll just complain to everybody. Uh, <laughs> we can we can do that. Like we can start making those changes, but we can't wait on them. It has to be something where, you know, we step up and again, how do you love the woman in your neighborhood in front of you? And it might be as simple as, you know, offering childcare services or, you know, Hey, I'm down the street. If it's 3am and your kid's colicky, I went through that with my own child. Give me a call. I'm going to be there so you can rest for a minute because you have a midterm coming up. I mean, there's so many different ways that I think if everybody did something small, it doesn't take, you know, 10 groups doing something big. And it's actually going to be better and more life affirming in creating this life culture. Because again, like we have that relationship and when you love people and you truly know them, you go to the ends of the earth to help them versus policies that just see you as a number. Anybody else want to chime in on that question? Thank you, Destiny. Destiny, um, this is uh, Dr. John. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you said. For us, we started out as a for-profit and because of the crazy economics of healthcare, and the division between conservative and liberal, we, we had to practice excellent medicine and see the least. And so we went not for profit. So I, can, I jokingly say that we're the last almshouse practice in America. When you address your community as a community and you cross church got boundaries and you go across the spectrum to believers of all faiths and all non-faiths and say we have a real problem on our hands here and you elicited you elucidated those perfectly both you and sister and the rest of the panel by sharing your burden with your community 
the community becomes kind of like a communion where everybody does their little part. We have people who maybe have a room to spare or a car and we do our utmost <laughs> to not demonize anybody because I've been on both sides. I, mean, I can't do that. And yet the community rises to the occasion. And it's not just policy at that point, it's a community taking care of their own in our own place. And I think as a believer, the spirit moves in different communities in different ways. And all of us have touched on parts of that. That's all. Yeah, I, I was just, if Jess, if it's time, if, is it okay? Yeah, go um, ahead. I was just gonna add very, um, hopefully briefly, just that, um, yeah, just to echo everything that Dusty and, and Dr. John have said. And um, I think people can tend to be um, very comfortable, you know, just as Americans in general, we're really comfortable. And I think um, now is the time to really uh, grow in solidarity and, and make sacrifices. Some of these, maybe an extra car or frequent flyer miles, which I've tapped into all for be able to get access for women to move places. Um, aren't even offering really that sacrificial element, but I think, I think, um, yeah, I, I just think that's something that we need in order to, to build a culture of life, this willing heart to kind of, you know, love your neighbor. And one thing I would say just about education since Notre Dame, um, you know, the McGrath Institute is hosting this, uh, something I've been working on recently too, is just, for instance, here, there's over 50 Catholic high schools in the archdiocese what is your pregnancy policy? Do kids actually know they won't be kicked out? Um, higher education, uh, there are, I can count on one hand the amount of higher education uh, universities, colleges in the US, which there's over 4,000 colleges and universities in the US. I think less than 10 have a dorm for pregnant women um, uh, or you know, especially women who already have a child or maybe have two children. Uh, I just think that's a huge need and would be um, something that I would love to see more of. Thank you. Um, I think what will probably be our last question, and we've had really robust conversations. So um, if you haven't had your question answered, please send them to us. We'll try to get them answered for you. But is uh, regarding um, Dr. Buchowski's um, comments on the medical side. So how do we make sure that physicians um, have the protections they need. I've heard, I've heard this from a lot of people, physicians worried about being sued or arrested, et cetera, uh, for breaking uh, laws, um, no abortion laws that they either, however the state decides to interpret those. How do we make it clear that physicians um, are, are free to give women the medical care that they need? I've heard from a few different people this past week that physicians will be arrested for addressing miscarriages, that physicians will be prosecuted for dealing with ectopic pregnancies. What do we need to do to make sure that, that the, the content of the laws is clearly communicated to physicians, to hospitals, to nurses, et cetera? Can I do something to frame what you said too, much like Erica did? Sure. The, um, and you and I have talked about this, Jess, I think. Uh, <clears throat> we need to be ready, not only to do justice on the level that you just talked about, and that's where our priority should be. We also need to be ready for our opponents on these issues to really exploit the deaths of women, yeah. uh, much like happened in Ireland with, the, with Savita's death in ways that are dishonest, mm -hmm. uh, but point to something real and a real concern that we ought to have here. So yes, absolutely, priority one, getting it right on the ground. But there's another part to this, which is a political Absolutely fight right. that's coming. I wonder if um, one thing that the pro-life movement could do at this point would be to propose a model abortion law, um, because that's actually how the pro-choice movement um, got its start, was with the, the American Law Institute in 1959 adopting a model abortion law that would liberalize uh, laws uh, for any state that adopted this, and a number of states did. And of course, by the end of the 60s, the, the abortion rights movement had moved on to other things and wanted a much more expansive law. But that was the beginning of the movement. And in my view, 
uh, that's one of the pro-life movement's uh, significant weaknesses at the moment is um, the failure to give a unified legal answer to the question of what next. Um, and if there could be a clear model law that would deal with issues such as ectopic pregnancy that could, um, could address uh, protections that are needed for the rights of doctors, um, honestly, protections for women, uh, a firm stance against uh, the so-called uh, abortion abolitionist movement that would like to uh, create uh, criminal penalties for women um, who have abortions. I mean, if, if the pro-life movement could get behind a legal code and say, this is, this is the answer, here is, here is a law that will protect unborn life, but at the same time address um, all of these areas uh, that are, are coming up as uh, either red herrings or as legitimate questions. Uh, but I, I think um, getting out in front of the conversation uh, would be useful. And in a sense, um, we've already lost time uh, in the sense that these, these conversations have now been going on for a couple of weeks. Uh, but the, the sooner that a, a model law could be proposed and gain widespread support, um, I, I suspect the sooner that, that uh, we could address some of these, these uh, potential objections. So Erica, as the, the lawyer on the panel, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. Yeah, I absolutely think that that needs to be done. And I'm actually in the midst of organizing something. So some of you will be hearing calls <laughs> or getting uh, Zoom, so, you know, we'll get together via Zoom. Cause I think that's absolutely right. And I think one concern I have is that there will be competing pro-life proposals, um, namely uh, dealing with some of the, some of the things that um, Dan just raised. So I think it is really important um, that those of us who um, especially don't want to conceive of this in terms of competing absolute rights that really um, we don't want to see the pro-life movement overreach in the way of sort of this absolute right to life of the unborn so that it does not do justice to the life um, or other sorts of situations of, of um, the mother. And I think we have to be really, really careful about that. So yeah, I, um, I think that that's, um, that's got to be in the works. It is in the works as we speak. Um, so Hopefully there, we can put forward something very soon. Dr. Buchowski, I'd love to hear sort of your thoughts as a doctor on, on how to think about these questions that, that we're talking about. Um, from my perspective, Jess, um, what we've been talking about is a major portion. The other portion is the misinformation, disinformation mm -hmm. campaign generated towards pro-life, life-affirming physicians. Because like on so many issues today, uh, you, you get labeled and then it goes to disinformation, misinformation to marginalize you. And the science, which I believe is very, very clear for how I approach the human person and respect not only the dignity, but the integration of all these factors that we're all coming together to try to provide. And also being an OBGYN where they say eight to nine times in my lifetime, I'm gonna be sued for medical malpractice just because of being an OB. Uh, I'm happy to hear this. And it's gonna be both and again, it's going to be what we were just talking about, but I also think it's going to be, how do you, for us, how do you argue this approach to healthcare to medical boards that are going to be incentivized to not provide you licensure. And uh, that's, that's been part of it. Uh, you can't be an OBGYN and be risk averse. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the resilience of the patients, the beauty of the, the feminine uh, body, soul, and spirit, her genius, I'm telling you, makes us happy to serve because we listen to the history and provide the physical. Um, but that is gonna come under attack here because I think just like uh, we're now moving in ACOG to medical abortions, which we're not even counting yet. So we have no idea what that yeah. true number is. And then all the, you know, you talk about trafficking, Charlie. We don't screen for trafficking. We don't screen for ectopics. We don't provide inpatient care. It's over the tele medicine screen for these medical abortions that are now becoming the wave of the future, you know, more than 
50 percent of all abortions. So that's my perspective, Jess. I appreciate that. Um, for those who are on the call and wondering how they can get involved. So at first, I think you mentioned APLOG, Doc, Dr. Uh, Bruchowski. I'm going to drop that link in here. Um, it's the American Academy of Pro-Life OBGYNs. It's a great resource. They have um, uh, practice guidelines for physicians. Um, it's a great resource for folks who are interested in these questions moving forward. Um, I want to ask all of you to, to close us out. I realize that we're, we're sort of at the hour here. If you can offer one piece of advice to our audience, how to continue to promote um, the pro-life effort moving forward, one piece of advice that you'd have for for the average person who, who wants to be involved and wants to, um, to participate, what can they do? Are you I'll, go, I'll go first. <laughs> Just to say, um, I guess one advice would be communicate. Communicate uh, like really the resources that are available to women. Communicate them in your sphere of influence, whether it's your parish, your church, your gym, your school. Um, that's what we really need help with. One thing that we need help with is being able to communicate, even get it to the women who need it most so that they know the resources are available. I would like to I would speak. say, oh no, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, I would say that a big, a big thing we need to be doing right now is listening to women, hearing their fears, helping calm them. As Dr. John said, there's so much that's just fear mongering right now. And so bringing facts to the table, bringing resources in your own community. Do you know where the local domestic abuse shelter is? Do you know where a women's shelter is? Do you know where the food pantries are? Put these all in one location because we can then empower women when no matter what crisis they're facing, when we are empowered with that information already. And this is also going to help, you know, our conversations with people who are afraid and saying, but what we've taken something away from women in their opinion, what are we giving them? What can we actually do? And so having those resources readily available and knowing all the information for your community so you can give them to people, I think is huge. And then just continue looking for common ground. When someone brings up a valid fear, like about criminalizing women for abortions and say that is absolutely wrong. I completely agree. What can we do together to, to fight things like this? Um, so find that common ground because this is, you know, the legal side of it is always kind of in limbo. The culture side is what we have to be working on. How do we actually persuade people, bring hearts and minds to understand not just the human dignity of the unborn child, but also the human dignity of the woman? Dr. John? I was, I was going to speak directly to students, um, medical uh, interns and residents, and their parents and concerned family. Do not be afraid you can practice excellent life-affirming medicine that uh, improves human flourishing in obstetrics and gynecology. You need to contact folks who have been doing it for a while and let us help you and mentor you and even shepherd you through these hurdles in a way that is excellent, practical, and doable. Mm. Thank you. I'll just say, um... Let's, let's forget the assumptions of the past, especially the limit, limiting assumptions of the past. This is a new moment. Um, it's time to be um, the first phrase that came to mind just when you asked that, um, us to speak uh, was aggressively creative. Um, mm. uh, and if you can't be aggressively creative, take steps to empower young people who can be, because there are a lot of really good ideas of young uh, folks who, uh, who aren't burdened by the past um, and the assumptions of the past. So let's take steps to empower them. I think I would say, uh, you know, I would agree with what has been said so far. And I would also add uh, that if we can focus on the question, why do, do women have abortions? Uh, that that would go a long way toward figuring out what next steps to take. And I, I guess as I've asked that question myself and tried to, to do some research on this, I think that it is often, not, in, not invariably, but very often tied to, uh, to economic reasons. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then can we find uh, pro-life organizations, maybe it's a local 
crisis pregnancy center. Maybe it's something, maybe it's an organization working uh, through a church. Maybe it is um, a national organization, but can we find an organization uh, that recognizes that and then is providing some practical help? And is there a way that we can get involved? I think, um, I guess I would say that I think a really, really important point that has to be pushed in, I think, creative ways, but is the way in which, you know, for the last 50 years, we've entirely let men off the hook, that there's this, you know, basic inequality when it comes to sex and the way that people have been talking about this and the reaction to Dobbs is as though men, you know, women are struck pregnant somehow. Um, I think, you know, just hearkening back again to, you know, the 19th century women's rights advocates, one of their slogans was votes for women, chastity for men. And I think there has to be a way in which, um, you know, I, I mean, I would commend kind of, you know, the Ezra Klein podcast I did in which he asked me what I thought about sexual pleasure, <laughs> um, which was kind of a, a big question there. But I just think it's, um, you know, really for women to start recognizing just either looking at the data that shows this or their own personal yeah. experience, how commitment um, is really, um, you know, where they, um, you know, in friendship and good, strong relationships with a man is where they actually enjoy sex the most. Mm -hmm. um, and then engaged fatherhood, I think, is really the answer to these asymmetries, um, that it's when men take seriously their duties to their children. And uh, so expecting that kind of response from men is, I think, really one of the, the main steps forward. And we have great models all around us on this webinar and in so many people's lives. So. I want to thank all of our panelists for their time amidst this very busy moment um, in, in the pro-life movement. I want to thank our audience members for joining us. If you submitted a question that was not answered, we do have it. We will try to get it answered for you. If you find you have a question um, after the webinar, please feel free to email us at life at nd.edu. Um, and we will try to get that answer uh, question answered for you. We will be making this webinar panel available. Uh, it should be out on Thursday, uh, sometime Thursday, and we will email you when it is available. I um, just wanna thank you all again so much for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. Um, and uh, we hope you have a wonderful afternoon and a great week. Thank you all, bye-bye.